Hello, my name is Teresa. I'm a comic artist and illustrator, and today I'm going to talk about one of my favorite comic authors, which is Taiyo Matsumoto. In this video essay, I'm going to introduce his work and discuss why I like it so much and why maybe you should want to give his work a read. Before I get started, though, I want to clarify two terms that I'm going to be using in the video. I'm going to be talking about comics, and when I talk about comics, I'm referring to the medium in all of its forms from the newspaper funnies to European hardcover albums and everything in between and beyond. And if I talk about manga, I'm talking about comics mostly made under the specific constraints and conventions of the Japanese comics industry. Now that that's out of the way, let's get right into it. Okay, Taiyo Matsumoto is a genre-breaking, industry-crossing author. Even though he's Japanese, some would claim his work is not manga, due to the heavy influence of Franco-Belgian comics on his work. Matsumoto himself has talked about this difficulty to fit in with these industries, saying that I'm neither manga nor band in it. So it's a little tricky at Japanese shonen events when I don't fit in with the cosplayers. Or in Europe, when I'm supposed to be the manga guy. Even inside the shonen manga industry, he's had a go at many of the most popular subgenres and other less represented genres. Ping Pong, for example, is his attempt to do sports manga, whereas Blue Spring falls inside the category of Yakuza gangster manga. Black and White, on the other hand, is an action shounen manga, whereas Go Go Monster is fantasy and Sunny, slice of life. But putting his work inside these categories is difficult in itself, because they don't really fit in with all the other work in these categories. This difficult classification also affects his popularity and sales, and finding his latest work in a comic book shop is not very common in Europe. I first got to know his work through the film adaptation of one of his original mangas, Black and White, which was released under the title of Taconkin Creed. By the way, I highly recommend you watch this uh, film, it's excellent. Personally, I watched this film simply because thematically it's 100% my jam. Uh, I love stories about children with superpowers in realistic settings. And after watching the film, I went on to read the comics. First time I saw one of his comics, I have to admit, I felt a little bit underwhelmed. The art wasn't as clean and dynamic as the one in the film. But as I read on, I was hooked and convinced it was much better. The film did capture some of the tenderness and charm of the two main characters, but in the end, the relationship between the two in the film becomes a bit of an excuse to make a point about an Eastern idea of balance. In the manga, on the other hand, the relationship is dealt with beautifully, and you see that despite the fact that Taiyo Matsumoto makes use of fantasy in his work, he is actually dealing with human interaction in its smallest details. He captures gestures, small reactions, and all of those little details of human activity that sometimes go unnoticed. Being a very unobservant person myself, I couldn't help but be moved with the veracity of these little moments he so beautifully depicts. And in a way, it almost makes me feel bad. How many times have I missed the importance of a slight change in someone's face or ignored the significance of a small gesture? Best thing is, all these little moments so masterfully portrayed are completely unassuming. There's no desire to make a big show of these human experiences. It's just that, everyday life, normal human interaction with just the right amount of emotional charge. But somehow, through his vision, these moments eclipse all of the other elements of the story with their disarming honesty. I'm gonna go through a little example now from Sonic. Sonny is a serialized seinen manga, so it's a manga that is marketed for grown men, based on Matsumoto's own experience in a foster home as a child. In this manga, the main cast is a group of children and their carers is in a foster home. These children are not orphans, they simply have parents that are either unable or unwilling to look after them. A lot of the tension in this slice of life manga comes from the fact that they are going on with their lives, doing all these mundane things, you know, just being kids, going to school, running errands, while bearing this huge emotional load of feeling abandoned and unwanted. What I love about this story is the fact that this internal trauma is not over-dramatized, it's not overt, it's not used for show or to generate conflict. 
So let's compare a usual orphan story in a popular shonen manga. Let's quickly look at a scene of Gara in Naruto 131. In this scene, Gara has a flashback where he remembers how as a child he was hurt. His aunt explains that love can cure this hurt. And Gara becomes hopeful and runs around happily. But then his aunt tries to kill him and he becomes an absolute psycho for the rest of the section of the story. Okay, so here's chapter 130 of Naruto where Gara has this massive flashback to his deepest traumas. Okay, so let's start here. Again, this is a Japanese um, comic, so we start here and we go in that direction. Right to left. So let's start with this dramatic reading, shall we? What does it mean to hurt? I've never been, even been injured, so I was wondering what it felt like. Moment of silence. Well, I'm not sure how to describe it. It's kind of painful, kind of unbearable. In short, I guess you could imagine being hit or cut and you can't hold it in or be yourself any longer. I can't really describe it. It's not fun, definitely. Yashamaru. Then, Yashamaru, do you hate me? See, little Gara here, having a bad day. Humans live their lives hurting others and being hurt in return. But despite that, all that, people still love more than they hate. Thanks, Yashamaru. Maybe I'm starting to understand what it means to hurt now. Is that so? So, could I be injured too? Just like everyone else? It always hurts. It doesn't bleed, but it hurts right here. Okay, and then we're going to skip to the section where she tells she tries to kill him. Because, you know, that happens. So here we go, he's all happy, running around. Suddenly he gets, you know, a little bit stared at and stuff and he doesn't like it. So he kills a couple of people. His dad is all like, why you go? Running about killing people. And he just sits here in the roof, being all dramatic. And then he's having some sort of fit here, just remembering stuff. And suddenly someone tries to kill him. Here we go, they're throwing food at him. Well, they're throwing stuff at him. And he gets really angry. And then he kills this person. Here we go. Who? Why? Who tried to kill me? Takes off the the cloth from this killer's face and oh 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 it's his aunt oh and now he goes crazy becomes totally crazy just shouts and stuff so yeah that's the this scene. is often the case in shonen manga and in comics for children in general, where childhood pain and trauma is used in a hyperbolic way in action comics to motivate future extreme behavior. Now, let's look at a similar flashback in Sunny. This is a scene where Makio, a former foster child, is having a sleepover in the foster home. Makio is now a grown man and goes to university, but he goes back to the foster house every so often to help out and spend time with his kids. The child in the scene, Haruo, convinces Makio to sleep in his room. Makio and Haruo have a quick heart-to-heart. -heart. Okay, so here's the sleepover scene. This is my copy of Sunny. Let me just zoom out. This is my copy of Sunny. Uh, Sunny by Tai Matsumoto. And this is the front and this is the back. Because they didn't change the... Uh, yeah, it was 17 pounds. Um, this is the scene I was talking about. And I'm gonna do a dramatic reading for you, okay? So here we go. So I kicked their butts and said, next time I'll gouge your eyes out. Crazy. Gonna get hurt if you keep dishing it out like that. No problem. Kids outside are all dorks. Shh. You wake, say. Hmm. He won't wake up. He's always asleep, grinding his teeth. So this is the new kid, say. 
What you got there, Haru? Nivea. Smells good. Sure does. Your mom gave it, got it, get it for you? Yeah. You see her soon on your next break, right? I'm gonna tell Yun and the others tomorrow. They'll be jealous that I'm your favorite. So you see here, Haru is trying to change the topic. Right, Haru? Mm, Akio. Actually, I don't want to see my mom. What? No, I want to, but I don't want to. When I see her, I think about when I have to say goodbye and I feel my heart's gonna pop. At first, I used to dream about her next visit every day. But there's only three visits a year, right? And halfway through, that's all I can think of, you say. It's listening. Now, I'm scared just thinking of the next visit. Yeah, that's weird, right? I want to see her, but I don't want to. Hmm, Makio, you got a girl? Out of the blue? Well, do you? So again, he's trying to change the topic. And this is the section that I'm going to focus on next, which is when he starts to say how he feels, and then we get this flashback of his little hand holding the mom's hand, the train tracks, and a shadow. We don't even see him, but we know that that is Haruo and that is his mom. Okay, back to the video. These two scenes show a clear difference in the nature of Matsumoto's work in contrast with other popular mangakas. In Sunny, pain and trauma is represented more realistically. Life goes on, and the pain is just a filter that colors some thoughts, choices, and interactions. But it is not the foundation for life philosophies, revolution, or evil plans or heroic plans. And it certainly doesn't turn people automatically into villains or heroes. Another element that jumps out as being very different is the attention to detail, especially mundane detail. Taiyo Matsumoto's stories pay close attention to small detail, instead of showing their characters clearly emoting, like in Gara's scene, when Haruo is being most open and honest about his pain and showing the flashback, we don't even see his face. I find this choice very powerful. Looking away when a character is being open and honest is something that Matsumoto does often. Let's look at another example of this technique. In this scene of Gogo Monsters, Makoto asks Yuki why was he crying. Both boys are not looking at each other and it shows either what they're looking at or some scene happening at the same time somewhere else. Okay, this next section that I'm going to read is from Gogo -Go Monsters. And uh, again, this is the end of the book. Spoilers. And this is the beginning of the book. So the back in the west is the beginning in the east. And we have to read it all the way uh, from this side to that side. Um, okay, let's go to the three sections that I find interesting and how they connect. And I'm going to take you through them. So the first section is this section, which is the conversation between Yuki and Makoto. As you can see, Yuki is the one with the little plaster in his face and uh, Makoto is the little one with the rosy cheeks. So let's have a little dramatic reading of this moment. I was worried about you. I thought maybe you had a stomachache or something. And so there's a little bit of silence here and then he looks at his hands and continues. I'm turning into a grown-up. I feel them less and less. Before long, I won't be able to see anything. I'll be stiff and rotten through. I keep asking Superstar to take me away with him to the other side. But he doesn't answer me. In my opinion, this is a way to diffuse the drama of the scene. It takes away the emotional intensity and keeps the same quiet tone for the entire book. However, the emotional resonance is there, especially if you've been paying attention and making connection with previous scenes and the overall theme. 
Let's look at that. Okay, so that's the first scene where he confesses how he feels to his friend Makoto. And if we go back, there's the scene several pages before when he is crying. So as you can see, he is very wet and everyone's playing in the swimming pool. And it's only here that he notices, even though he's playing with his friends here, he still looks at uh, Yuki and realizes that this is not just water, this is a tear. Personally, I didn't even pick up on that when I first read it. I was like, oh, Makoto is a very observant, observant boy. First of all, the theme of Go Go Monsters is growing up and changing our views and feelings about the world that surrounds us. It's about the small magical things children see in the world and how, as we grow up, they become invisible. Secondly, the previous scenes. We know through the previous scenes that Yuki feels strongly about crying in public. In a previous scene, he talks about how crying is something that girls do to get their own way. Okay, and this is the previous section. I was talking about where he talks about girls and crying. So let me just read through this very quickly. <sighs> we didn't mean to ditch you, Keiko, honest. Are you mad, Keiko? We don't know what's the matter if you if all you do is cry. So you see they're in a station and there's these girls just passing by. There's one of them crying, all the little friends behind asking her what's wrong. And then we hear a voice. It says, come on. Girls cry easily, she says, Yuki. That's because crying gets, uh, gets you your way. If you're a girl, that is. There's a moment of silence. Why? What? Why do you always say stuff that weirds people out? Was Yuki crying to get Makoto's attention? We also know that other classmates believe that Yuki is an attention seeker because of the strange things he always talks about. Yuki is probably crying out for attention, but he's being very subtle about it. He cries in public only when he's just come out of the pool. Only a boy as observant and considerate as Makoto would pick up the fact that Yuki is crying. And this is precisely what Yuki wants to talk about. He wants someone who can understand his worry. When Makoto asks him about him crying in the swimming pool, it doesn't take Yuki long to admit to Makoto that he's worried he's becoming an adult and can't see things anymore and is becoming stiff. Makoto can't see magical beings like Yuki can. But what he can see is Yuki's sadness, isolation and past his facade. I love this kind of storytelling and character development. And if you compare it to shonen manga, which by the way, I like, but I'm just contrasting it. In shonen manga, normally we have characters that are able to express very clearly their motivation and worldviews. They can be in the middle of a battle and they'll still talk about their psychological development, their traumas, their motivations, their, their view of life with no problem whatsoever to be articulate about those very difficult things. However, Matsumoto's characters are not necessarily aware of their behavior and cannot explain clearly the root of their suffering. So they feel more real and less archetypical. I think this also relates to the art. If you look at the art of shonen manga, typical shonen manga, it's very iconic, very clear, and it doesn't have a lot of unnecessary detail. However, if you look at Matsumoto's settings in his comics, he has an accumulation of imperfect details. You can see a character's eyelashes and you can see the texture of the sheets carefully cross-hatched. But all of these little details are slightly imperfect. This contrasts massively with shonen manga clean line and clear tones, where the aim is to create an iconic character that can be read easily. Taiyo Matsumoto's characters are just the same. He builds his characters through an accumulation of details and small imperfections. And in this accumulation of imperfect detail is the beauty of his work, both in the art and the writing. Or at least that's my opinion of it, and that's why his comics are one of my favorite things. If you listen this far, I congratulate you. Taiyo Matsumoto is one of my biggest inspirations and I could go on for hours about his work. But in this video, I've just been talking about his use of detail and his characterization to explain why I love his work. 
I hope this little window into the differences between my, Matsumoto's work and your usual shonen manga gives you an idea of what to expect if you want to buy one of his books. And that is it for Tayo Matsumoto. My next comics I love will be about Chris Ware. And this one is a really hard one because I'm trying to find the one thing that really makes me like these authors. In the case of Tayo Matsumoto, it's the attention to detail and how he uses it to portray realistic emotion. In the case of Chris Ware, to be honest, I'm toying with three or four ideas at the moment and I'm, I'm hoping to condense it into one. Until then... I hope you enjoy reading comics. Let me know what your favorite comic is. Let me know if you really like Tayo Matsumoto or you hate it. If you can tell me why, I really appreciate that type of explanation. So uh, until then, I hope you have fun. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.